Good morning. You just said you, you got your workout in. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good, man. Yeah, it's Monday. And Monday, if I knock my workout out, you know, by 8 or 9 a.m., usually that means the week's going to be good. So off to a good start. And you're, you're in, uh, are you in Kansas, I'm guessing? Yep. Yeah, I live in Lawrence, Kansas. And uh, I travel a bit in the off season, but in June and July, that's our big summer block. So June and July, I'm locked in right here in the, the middle of nowhere, which is Lawrence, Kansas. But it's it's a great city, but yeah, it's in the middle of is nowhere. That, is that central time? Yep, it is. Yeah, exactly. Are the uh, are the Jayhawks basketball team in training right now? We are. Yep. Yeah, we're in the heart of our summer block, uh, June and July. So we started. We're starting. Okay. So we're two weeks in, and the summer block is eight weeks. And then for us this year, we'll go to Puerto Rico in the first week of August. So we'll train for eight weeks straight, and then we'll go to Puerto Rico for um, eight days as well. And then they'll get the rest of August off as they're off season um and uh and that's when i get to travel a little bit so this year i'm going to uh, thailand and bali in august so excited oh, for that. oh man there you go i was about to ask uh, if other teams will come to puerto rico with y'all but that's so that's not like a preseason tournament or anything or will they yeah no it's not a preseason tournament we'll play uh the puerto rican national team i think or maybe a couple mm -hmm. other teams they're still working on the games but um we're gonna be out there uh well, technically, we'll be in, we'll be in Puerto Rico for eight days, but we're traveling on the first and last day of that, and then we just we're gonna play a game, practice, play a game, practice, and do that three times and get out of there. So it should be a good week, though. But yeah, nice. no college teams will be there, just uh, their professional teams. A uh, South Carolina legend, Ronaldo Bachman, plays plays down there. Uh, okay. So y'all might be playing Ronaldo. He he was like this crazy rebounder uh, for the University of South Carolina. Ended up getting drafted really high to the Knicks, but. Now I just see him playing for Puerto Rico. Uh, tell people what you do for Kansas right now. Yeah, so I'm currently the director of sport performance here at the University of Kansas for the men's basketball program. And I've been here um, four seasons, which is uh, crazy to say out loud, but it's it's been fast, but it's been exciting. We had some success. We won the national championship in 2022, two years ago. And um, But just like most things in life, it's, the, the lesson of what have you done for me lately? So we can't, uh, you know, take too much claim and excitement in that because we got to move forward and try to win another one. So, um, but That's yeah, right. training the basketball team. It's wild too, man. You're only, uh, you're still so young. You're 32 years old. You you know, the head performance strength or performance coach at strength sports performance coach at Kansas. And you've had, I mean, you've kind of been breaking that barrier your whole career, but I want to hear how you grew up. Like what was Ramsey doing? Uh, I think you were in San Francisco. You know, what was life like for you as a kid? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in California in the Bay Area, uh, about an hour east of San Francisco. And, um, you know, I don't know, pretty pretty normal standard stuff there, right? Played sports growing up, uh, American, you know, the three big here in the States at least. So baseball, basketball, football, always took the basketball. Um, and then, you know, the classic example of wanting to be an NBA player, but I'm 5'10 on a good day. Uh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, unless you ask me in front of my girlfriend, in which case I'll tell you I'm six feet. But um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it wasn't good enough, tall enough, all those excuses to make it and realize that strength and conditioning was a job. So pretty quickly from, um, you know, my freshman year of college, I did my undergrad at UC Santa Barbara in Southern California. And, um, you know, since then, I've kind of been chasing the strength and conditioning path and, you know, it's crazy. You look up and it's like, that was 10 years ago. And here we are uh, a decade in and have been able to find some level of success throughout my career and those good things. But um, it's just crazy. Cause like, you know, I, I never say what has transpired was the vision for my career by any means. Uh, but the vision was always just like work hard and try to get places. I did want to become an NBA strength coach. That was a goal pretty early. Um, but goals change, and I found myself, you know, obviously here in Kansas. So, yeah, it's been with, a wild ride for sure. With uh, with the college, you know, what what does that entail of you being like, all right, I want to be in strength and conditioning? Do you start working for the sports programs there, or like start taking classes? You know, what kind of path is that during your college years? Yeah, I mean, from the most part, you're gonna need to get an undergraduate degree in something related, um, kinesiology, exercise science. Uh, exercise physiology sport performance is now kind of a term you know in the 80s and 90s it was like physical education 
Mm -hmm. uh, they've learned some of that language, but um, yeah, you're going to need to do that. And then obviously get that experience. So if you can, you'd love to get experience at your university, which is what I was able to do. I worked for the UC Santa Barbara athletics department while being a student, uh, landing an internship uh, for that. But, you know, everyone's path is a little bit different, but at some level you're going to need to get experience ideally in the team sports setting in college. And if you could do that while getting degrees, then even better. And then now, you know, they have GA positions. So like currently we have a grad assistant who will get his master's for free while he's working for us. So he's kind of killing two birds with one stone, right? He's getting yeah. more formal education and experience. So uh, yeah, a lot of different routes there, but in general, you're going to need to get some experience and probably get some degrees. You've, uh, I think professionally, or, or maybe you've been consulted with, with a number of like different sports, but for early on, was it mainly basketball coming out of college that you kind of wanted to get into? Yeah, for sure. I, I always I wanted to work with basketball players and basketball team, just my background uh, and kind of who I am and my personality, I think fits much better within the basketball culture. You know, I can train any sport because if I understand training at a high level, you could figure out how to train people and doing anything, right? Um, but as far as the relationships go, the actual coaching, uh, relating to players, creating buy-in, holding on, all of those things that we also have to do, I feel like I'm most effective in basketball. And in part, it's because I know the game. And so I think there's a level of um, credibility that comes from that, you know, mm -hmm. speak to the game that you're training for. Uh, yeah, so I always knew I wanted to, you know, work in basketball and uh, – I really can't see myself working anywhere else now. Uh, not that I don't think I could do an okay job, like maybe, but I don't know if I could be that effective. Yeah. You know, so with uh, with the Kings, you had to be happy with their their season this past year. Yeah, for sure. What an incredible run! For They've sure. Had, and, uh, I always knew De'Aaron Fox would be a stud, but damn, that whole team is pretty good. They are, man. So. Uh, Talk to me about the opportunity you get with the Kings and then it progresses to you becoming the youngest head strength conditioning coach in the NBA. Yeah, I was uh, what, 23 at the time. I was really 22 when the conversation started. I was fresh out of my master's degree. And the gentleman who was the athletic, um, the director of athletics um, or sport performance for the Kings at the time is a gentleman named Chip Schaefer. And I worked with him for one year during my undergrad at UC Santa Barbara. Well, Chip Schaefer is Phil Jackson's right-hand guy throughout the NBA. The dude's been to 13 finals, won 11 rings. Uh, he knows everybody throughout the NBA. So as an undergrad, you know, I told him, I said, Chip, I really want to work in the NBA. And uh, he said, well, you know, hey, I'll help you out. And um, sure enough, he did. I went to get a master's degree. We stayed in touch. And I get a phone call. I still remember it was actually, this would have been December 2013. He gives me a call and it's winter break. I'm working in the college sector. All my students are out for Christmas break. So I fly back home to Sacramento or fly up to Sacramento with, to watch a Kings game. And Chip had invited me to a game. And he said, hey, why don't you come to a game, man? I want to chat with you about something. So I go to the game and he just kind of mentioned, mentions in passing there, hey, they're talking about letting me get an assistant. Would you be interested in that? And I'm like, of course, Chip. Uh, and sure enough, you know, I found myself interviewing. I remember I was, so that was December 2013. Come July of 2014, Summer League, they fly me out to interview for a job. And I'm, you know, 23 years old and I'm warming up an NBA team during a Summer League. I got general managers watching. Uh, I remember thinking, oh, shit, I'm about to fail at this. Uh, but sure <laughs> enough, you know, he called me back and offered me the job. And uh, that was 2014 at that point that summer I got the job and started in September. So, um, yeah, Chip was the one who really took a chance on me and gave me an opportunity as the assistant. And then I did that for two years under him. And then he looked back to Chicago Bulls, which is where he's currently working. And, uh, now I'm 25 and, and, you know, Chip calls, he says, Hey man, I'm, I'm going back home to Chicago. I'm going to take a role with the Bulls and the first elections. And the second thing I said was, does that mean I'm fired? And uh, he said, well, you'll have to kind of wait and see because it's the NBA. Uh, and sure enough, they they gave me the opportunity to to kind of do it. It's funny because I remember the next morning I'm going in to run a draft workout. is no longer allowed to be part of it because he's under contract with a new team. And they come to me and they say, hey, do you think you can run this? And I said, the draft workout, of course. And he said, no, not the draft workout. We mean the apartment. 
can you be the head strength coach? And I said, come on, man, you know I could do this shit. And I remember <laughs> just saying it's like that, so confident. Uh, and but but underneath the confidence was, you know, fear and scared and not sure, uncertainty, um, imposter syndrome, all the things that we deal with. Sure. Uh, can't tell that. And so, yeah, a few months later, I remember the GM came up to me with the head coach and they said, hey, congrats. And I said, on what? And he said, well, congrats on becoming the head strength coach of the team. I said, is it official? And I remember Vladi, who was our general manager at the time, he said, well, the GM tells you congratulations. I think that means it's official. And I was, <laughs> man, so excited and excited. You see, I'm like smiling ear to ear just because I remember those things. So, I mean, that, that was kind of how it came. It's incredible. You were 25, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. 25 years old. Dang, man. That's, uh, I mean, to think about being the head of any type of department, especially on an NBA team, um, like you said, that you had that confidence. And I feel like you had that confidence to know if you got the position, you you would figure it out. You know, um, that's one thing I think I'm good at. It's like, man, I, I can have the confidence out front and just underneath, I know I'll put in the work to, to figure it out, no matter what it really is. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It's totally that. I'm, I've never... I guess heard it said that way, but that, that resonates for sure. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I could do the job, not because I know how to do it right now. But I'll figure the shit out for you. So um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> with, uh, with working at the Kings, man, what was, uh, like, what were some of the, the players you worked with and like some of the freaks, you know, you had on the team? Yeah. I mean, um, the bigger names, Demarcus Cousins is one of them, Rajon Rondo, Ooh, I love Rondo, yeah. Um, and then some of the younger cats, newer cats. So De'Aaron Fox, who's an NBA All Star currently, we drafted him. Um, Buddy Hield, who's currently, I think, on. Um, will he ever do it? I don't know, but he's breaking every record on his way to becoming a leading three pointer who's ever played the game. Uh, Marvin Bagley was another young guy for us uh, a couple Jayhawks Ben McLemore who played here at Kansas Frank Mason who played here at Kansas and yeah. that's actually how I kind of get in the role by working with some of those guys um, so yeah and then you know when I was with the Kings we weren't a playoff team and when you're not a playoff team what's t what typically happens is you have roster turnover every year because you're trying to become a playoff team so when years when you lose you trade guys get new guys so I feel like I look up and I've worked with like 50 to 60 NBA players at this point uh, just because every year we had new players. You were with the Kings for five years? Correct. Yeah, two years as the assistant and then three years as the head strength coach. What was uh, was your next job, the one at Kansas? It was, yep. I came straight from that role to, to here in 2019, September 2019. What was the, um, I mean, I had to, you know, again, there had to be some fear there, or what was the reason reason for the move? Yeah, I mean, a ton maybe because the NBA is a fun role and a fun opportunity and it was my dream job the biggest fear factor that came from that was just leaving or walking away from my dream job right it's like I'm comfortable and content and really excited about going I had a feeling that eventually they would figure it out this year because the things that were needed the foundation that we needed to create something special was was at play right we had drafted deer and fox and so we had some momentum um uh, and I, and I just finished my first three-year deal. I signed an extension in August 2019. And like a week after signing my extension, our head coach here, Bill Self, get a voicemail. This is a random voicemail. Like, yeah, I remember I was actually working out, and I had a missed call from a number I didn't recognize. I listened to the voicemail, and it just says, hey, Ramsey, it's Coach Bill Self. Wanted to reach out and chat to you about an opportunity we have. And so, um, yeah, it was it was just a crazy, crazy time, crazy month. At first, turned it down, like – gave coach a call back. I always say, you know, whenever you're going to have big moments in your career, in your life, you typically think about them before you hit the phone call, right? Before you hit dial, you think about it. You might have a pros and cons list. You might have a notepad. At least I do. Like I'm, I'm a thinker. I, got, I hit the call back so quick because I knew I was turning it down. I called coach. <laughs> back. I said, coach, Hey, I'm just calling out of respect for you. You know, you're a hall of famer. I've worked with Ben McLemore and Frank Mason out of respect for what you've done, the University of Kansas, I'm calling you back. But frankly, I'm not I'm not your guy. You know, I love what I'm doing. But I said, and I remember saying, but I'm happy to find the right person for the role. And he just said, hey, bud, you're turning me down before we've even talked. Maybe you should hear me out. 
I said, well, that's that's probably fair, coach. I should probably hear you out. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that was how the, the transition had started for sure. Was uh, <clears throat> was it weird, your thought, too, going from the NBA back to, down to college? Is that like a fear, too? <sighs> yeah, I think so. And I think, like, even the words you use, right, like down to college, like, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. because it's we, we think professionals are the best, which they are. We think of that progression, right? Like the players want to go from college to the pros. So coaches should want to go from college to the pros. And here I am going from the pros down to college. Um, so yeah, that, that definitely, there was some concern there. Um, but I arrived at taking a job, really just going through a reflection period. I, it was really a movie. I had flown here for an interview and, you know, sometimes I feel like stars are just aligning. The world is just like sending you omens like you should do this. Uh, and my assistant in Sacramento is actually from Pittsburgh, Kansas. We were like two hours from here. He he came. He did his undergrad at the University of Kansas. So he knew all about this his dream role. And he was like the first call I make. And I said, hey, Ev, I'm calling you because University of Kansas just called and you know me, I'm a California kid, man. Like I'm an <laughs> NBA fan, California kid. I'm at home. My mom goes was going to every Kings game. And Ev was the one that said, Hey man, like you need to go inter- you need to go interview for that. You need to get your feet on the ground. It's not what you think. Cause I thought it would be just all cornfields and flat land. Sure. Um That's which what I, I think, think is of, what- yeah. Exactly, right? But Lawrence, where I'm so Kansas City, and I'm an hour from Kansas City city and little hub there's a ton of, and there's actually some hills not i mean i don't see mountains obviously like california but um it's just different than i had thought and so i'm very much glad i came to the interview and then i flew from here to maui actually I already had a vacation plan and i just remember sitting there looking at the sunsets every day in maui and reflecting on the king's role and what i really enjoyed about it and all i kept going back to was you really enjoy coaching. You really enjoy the young guys. You really enjoy the development side. You enjoy actually trying to hold players accountable and teach them about life. Mm-hmm. And I'm just sitting there. If those are all the things you enjoy about a job. College is where you can do that at a high level. You, you're expected to do all of that in college. And in the NBA, you're not expected to do those things. In the NBA, for the most part, you just expected to keep players healthy and maybe develop them a little bit. But here, it's like, no, you're expected to coach these guys. and um, and it's funny, like I said before, I look up now, I've been here for years, and I'm so happy with making that decision because all the things that I wanted, all the things I enjoyed about the Kings, I literally do every single day here. I'm, as I mentioned when we started, I'm literally hopping in my car for this call to go and do those things. So, um, yeah, very much happy. And one thing I learned, you know, learning lesson through was I was afraid to leave the NBA mainly because of what I thought other people would think, right? Mm-hmm. I, I thought sure. other people would look at that decision and say, well, why are you taking a step down? And I remember I put up on Instagram back then, it was one of my tweets and it just, it basically like write your own story. And um, no, that was the caption to an image that said like, it was like 39 new director of performance for Kansas, whatever like the media had. And as soon as I, posted that, that the amount of positive feedback i got text messages even from coaches in the nba hey ram what a great move um i think it's like perhaps your perceptions of what other people are going to think about you is often wrong and yeah. then two like you should never make decisions based on what other people are thinking make them based on what you think so yeah, yeah. man that was probably a lot a long way to say it's been a great decision do you know uh how did bill self get your number yeah, he got my number from a um, scout that I had worked with. I, I worked when I was with the Kings. We had one of our NBA scouts is actually really close to Coach Self, and um, he went to the University of Kansas, and so he they were in need of a coach. So he had sent him my contact, and I guess just texted him like one sentence and said, "This is your guy." Uh, mm-hmm. And nice. I think coach has been happy with it. You know, I always like look at that. And I mean, that me and that gentleman, his name's Bill Pope. Me and him are very close. And um, when, when we won the national championship, we had conversations and I kind of had said like, well, I'm glad I didn't let your recommendation down because you never want to let someone down. So sure. when you win a national championship, it's almost like, all right, it all worked out. Yeah, it, it, it uh, validates it a little bit. 
with uh yeah. with your training methods for and we can start as a basketball player you know are you working in a lot of the movements they'll do on the court do they do the workouts with basketballs in their hands or are you more off the court like functional training and, and movement training yeah more the latter like off the court um i really don't touch any of the on-court stuff i understand the game um and so that helps with some of the stuff we do in the weight room um but we don't really do anything with a basketball in your hand it's it's more of your tradition in the weight room training but certainly functional and trying to make sure that everything we do translate to that basketball court what would be some of the key areas for like a basketball player like i mean for instance you know i don't see them needing to have like a huge chest if they're a point guard you know what i mean like are you trying to I, i'm a soccer player and i don't know like lean muscle mass you know you want to have like quick uh muscles more than like bulky muscles like what are some of the things you you look at for that yeah for sure i mean i think all of those things that start you gotta just um you know, not general training, but very specifically, what do these guys need? So you do a full needs analysis. Some of it is basketball specific, right? We understand basketball is this crazy hybrid of you need to be big, but not too big. You need to be fast, but you also need a level of endurance because the game is um, 40 minutes in college, 48 minutes in the NBA. Um, and then you need a level of strength. You don't need to be a strong man or a power lifter, but you do need to be strong because it is actually a physical game. Um and then on top of all of that, you start thinking about, okay, well, what are the common injury sites and injury history? And mm -hmm. um, and then how do you not only look at their injury history, but then how do you prevent future injuries? So what are common sites of injuries? And then how do we prevent those? Uh, so all of that kind of comes into play for sure. But, um, you know, in general, basketball players are relatively leaner individuals. They don't look like football players. Yeah, they're taller too. And they're really tall. And so you got to think about that from a biomechanics perspective. You know, we do a lot of, especially our heavy pulls and deadlifts from the from blocks instead of the floor, just so we can decrease the range of motion that they have to move from because they are so tall. I got a kid right now who's 7'2". Um, so, and then they got long limbs, long arms. So a lot of that comes into play. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of just this crazy puzzle piece. But I think that's what makes it fun and exciting. It's like there's so many different ways and angles that we can go at training these guys to be effective how do you um advise them on rest how much rest they need yeah i mean uh do you mean rest during a session or just rest overall like recovery wise let's do both because i think uh i think there's some misconceptions definitely around rest during a session yeah i mean in general uh we create the workout routines to actually accommodate the rest within the session without actually educating or communicating it to them my biggest thing I tell them is don't ever rush through your workout mm -hmm. because if you're not resting enough, then you'll have to decrease the load you're using. If you have to decrease the weight you're using, that changes the stimulus and the effect that we're trying to create in which that would change the adaptation. And so it's like, if you rush through your workout, you're going to change the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, and there's certain times where like, I might have a block where there's only two exercises. And what I tell our guys, is I literally want you to not work out right now. I want you to hit this set of five reps and then i want you just to chill out maybe we'll pair that with like a core movement or something where it's non-fatiguing because one challenge in college is i can't tell you just to sit down and relax because these kids will just talk to each other so you got to kind of manage your weight room in that regard um so it really just comes down to how we structure the workout but there's times where i don't want you to rest a lot like in the off season we don't rest a ton because we're trying to build some work capacity and conditioning and then there's times where we want to be very effective with our training and we're not worried about conditioning. We're more worried about the amount of weights you can move. And so mm -hmm. all of that comes into play. Um, and then recovery between days or general like rest throughout the week for, to make sure that they're recovered. Big one is just sleep. Like we try to tell these guys just sleep. Um, that's really hard to do in college, as you could imagine with Twitter and TikTok and whatever else the kids are on. Uh, so, you know, we definitely try to tell these guys like get as much sleep as you can in a single period so that's nightly and then you can add sleep through naps or sleep extension or you want to bank some sleep um so that way you're always well rested you mm -hmm. you are much better i think suited to just train your mind to be over over rested 
because our guys, I mean, it, the problem with, I think, recovery is we often think about modalities like foam rollers or Theraguns or mm-hmm. these, I mean, there's literally billionaire, billion dollar companies now that are built around recovery. Uh, I think you even had some of these people on, on your show, right? Sauna, yeah. all those things. And all that works. And I'm not saying it doesn't, but when it comes to actually recovering, and you actually started earlier when we were talking about like the mental component of just training and working out. It's like your body only has one bank of energy reserve. It's like, it's you. And so if you're stressed out, that's going to pull from that. If you're training hard, that's going to pull from that. If you're not getting enough sleep, that's going to pull from that. If you're not getting enough calories or nutrition, that's going to pull from that. So all of these things are your one system when you're one organism. And so it's not just sleep. It's like also get your life in order, right? Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're recovered throughout because if you have family drama, if you got relationship drama, if you got financial drama, if you got all that stress that we deal with, all of that will eat away at your ability to recover. Yeah, because that's also won't let you sleep as well. No doubt about that for sure. That's the table the stuff that keeps us up at night. With um with vitamins and and nutrients, are you, you know, are they what type of I guess nutrition plan you you like to see your athletes on? Yeah, good question. We have a full a team, really, but we have a full-time dietitian, and she has a staff. Um, we don't sit each player down for an individual um, meal plan, but they're all educated on the best options, what we're looking for at what times. And then they have a really uh, convenient – we have a really convenient food system here where all of our players get a card, um, which is basically like a credit card, but it's um, it only works at certain restaurants in town. And they can use that and go and get some food from those restaurants. And then our dietitian can send them the best options from each of those. Uh, but in general, like most of my guys are young. They're pretty lean. They, almost across the board, they all need to gain muscle. So we're just kind of hyper-focused and educating on protein and calories. And then we track body weight twice a week. And that helps hold everyone accountable, including myself, right? Like if our guys aren't moving in the right direction, I need to change their workout plan. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. And then hydration as well is, is part of that, right? You got to hydrate and rehydrate because we're on the court a ton. Yeah. With uh, with yourself, is there a certain amount of protein you try to get each day or, or on training days? Yeah, for sure. And it's the same thing I educate my athletes on, one gram per pound body weight. And that's not a great rule, but it's a nice rule of thumb. Yeah. You wanted to really, I think, look at the science. It's probably closer to 0.8 grams per pound body weight. And then you could go per pound lean mass, but it just gets really too complicated for athletes. So what I say is, you know, Sam, you were one of my athletes. I'll say, Hey, how much do you weigh? Eat one gram per pound of that. So for me, if I'm 185, I want to try to shoot for like 185. In my head, I just try to shoot for four to five doses of 40 to 50 grams. Okay. So right before this call, I, I had 40 grams of protein. I'll have another 40 in a few hours. I'll have another 40 closer to dinner time around six, my time. And then usually before bed, I'll chug a um, protein shake as well. Um, and that's like that, that is, that should remain consistent, whether you want to gain weight or lose weight, because sure. so many benefits of protein beyond just body composition. Yeah. There's been a lot of misconceptions around protein for years. Are you, are you um, like red meat, chicken, fish, all the above? All the above for sure. I'd say I'd probably eat majority chicken just because it's the easiest, um, yep. most convenient. Um, but yeah, I'm like the dude who steals uh, recipes from Instagram and TikTok all day and then tries to just make them at home. So uh, <laughs> yeah, all, all of the above and, and just mix it up. And, um, nothing against vegan or vegetarian options. Those are just harder options. I think mm-hmm. it's so much easier to just get an animal protein because it's a complete protein and um relatively easy to make as well right like chicken yeah, especially fryer and all that so chicken um, and rice good. man that's my go-to <laughs> no doubt easy too right <laughs> easy when you think about it, it comes there's so many times people complicate things and just because i always say just because the body is complex doesn't need it doesn't mean it needs to be complicated mm-hmm. like keep it simple keep it consistent and we were talking earlier it's like i'm i'm losing weight now and all i've added was like one hour of walking a day and very small tweaks to my diet and yeah. already working. Um, so consistency and simplicity seem to work pretty good. Yeah. I tell, uh, I tell some of the people I work with or, or friends and family is like, you got to keep it simple so it can be consistent. Cause mm-hmm. if you're trying to overcomplicate something, man, it's not going to stay consistent. So 
it's no. uh it's much easier to find a consistent simple option that you can mm -hmm. kind of just repeat over and over again with um with the apply performance coach is that your website it is yeah yeah it's uh my website and, and and more importantly like it's the company behind it which is it's a coaching course and a community mm -hmm. so um yeah we're, we're building i always say we like there's a ton of people behind it's like it's me in this office um <laughs> but building to me what's like uh i think the biggest and strongest performance coach community in the world and we have coaches all over the world it's crazy and we just did a, a in person. That's it, it's majority online. We do three cohorts a year currently, um, and then we just did our first inaugural in person summit, and that was in San Diego last month. And we'll do that hopefully next year and beyond. Um, but That's at cool. that event, I kicked that event off, and I said, "Hey, stand up if you've flown here internationally." And we had like seven people stand up, and there was people who flew fourteen hours to come in and hang out with us for the weekend. And it's just crazy to think about that. So, yeah, we have coaches all over the world. Um, we have over 20 coaches in the NBA now, which is amazing. People grab it. Basketball performance coaches have gravitated towards me just because of my career. But it's not just mm -hmm. we have coaches in the NHL, MLS, MLB, NFL. And then, like I mentioned, throughout the world in the private sector, in the high school sector, the college sector, and then obviously professional sports as well. So, uh, yeah, it was something that started during COVID and um, it's grown into something, you know, really special, I think for me with, um, so it's a, how many week course, eight week live course, eight, yep. got it. And it doesn't, it doesn't really ever end. Like coaches have access to it for in perpetuity for the rest of their life. But eight of the weeks are live where every week we get on a zoom call for one to two hours. I give a lecture and then answer a ton of questions and, um, kind of leaving no stone unturned. Just tell everyone everything from like career advice to the real X's and O's of how to train people. So it's kind of cool. Full gamut. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. With, uh, with Ramsey outside of basketball, outside of working and training, man, what do you, what do you like to do for fun? Oh man. Good question. I, you know, I get that a lot and I've never had a good answer. Um, <laughs> you don't play golf or something. I'm just kidding. I do play golf. You know, I should say like I play golf, uh, only when I moved here, I started playing golf. We have a, a golf course here in town, so our, our staff plays golf. I'm not very good. I have a twin brother who's really good at golf. He played, uh, and I'm just picking it up. So, yeah, I mean, golf and then, um, you know, playing pickup ball for sure. Um, but I think, like, I've found I get really excited about doing things like this. Like, this stuff is fun to me. Building the community Definitely. is fun to me. Uh, working is fun to me. I have a girl that I'm seeing now here in Kansas City. So spending time. How long time have y'all been dating? Uh, we've been dating a year and a half now. There you uh, go. So that's been good because I moved to Kansas, you know, not really knowing anyone. And like most things in life, like if you want to have fine success, it typically comes with the sacrifice. And so I'm not around family. You know, I didn't have friends when I moved here, right? Like I didn't know anyone. And so building, you know, friends and relationships and all of those and kind of building a life in this new place I'm calling home has been fun. With uh is your girl from Kansas? She's uh she lives in Kansas City. She's from Columbia originally. Cool. Uh South America? Uh yeah. Nice. She, soccer from, fan, uh, probably. Yeah. Huge soccer fan, yep. I'm one of my best friends is from Medellin. Um, and we were always talking trash. Uh, the USA soccer team played last night and uh, the Colombia national team also played played this weekend. Um, what is uh what's Coach Self like? He's the goat, man. He's the goat. He's uh probably the best leader and best coach I've ever seen. Like a big part of me coming here was just to be a fly on the wall for him. Like I just wanted to see what Hall of Fame and not only the maintenance of success looks like, but like the expectation of when. Anything. like that, that is the expectation here at Kansas is to win and on our bad years like on our bad years are for most teams the best years they'll ever oh, yeah. have our bad years are when we win 20 games and it's like your bad years teams. are still winning the conference dude <laughs> for sure last year was an example we won the conference last year we won the hardest conference last year the big 12 was considered the hardest conference potentially ever and we won seven games straight to win that game and we didn't make it too far in March. And it's like, that's not a great year for us. Um, 
But I think being around not only that type of expectation, but but a coach and a leader who who lives into it, you know, like he doesn't shy away from what's expected here and and doesn't micromanage like, you know, he always says we all have a job to do. Let's do our jobs. And um, and so it's so fun, I think, to be around an environment like that where it's he trusts me to do what I need to do and get done for him. Um, there's no, you know, like relative to professional sports, there's no politics and all those things it's like everyone show up that's your job enjoy it and let's win and um and that's what we do so yeah it's been it's been great and he's been incredible to work for yeah he's definitely I mean he's been there forever he's he's a goat for sure I remember him I think winning like Mario Chalmers and when I was in college back then I was 12 years He's been there a long time. So you uh you mentioned you got two uh two vacations coming up, one to Thailand and one one somewhere else. When when do you go there? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll go to Puerto Rico as a team in in August, August 1st through the 8th. I love and, Puerto Rico, by the way. Nice. I've never been, so I'm excited for it. Um that's more work related and then th- Thailand and Bali after that uh for 2 weeks. So, uh, it should be a fun month of August. When do uh when does preseason basketball start back up well the games won't start until november Mm -hmm. uh, early november um so we'll have you know basically september and october to kind of really get ready as well so we still are far away away this year for the feast week is when all the college team all the college teams play around thanksgiving they all play different tournaments and this year we're going to uh, Maui for our feast week tournament so that should be a good time as not well a bad so place we got a go. tough schedule but not bad at all man it should be great <laughs> all right uh wrapping up here um you know I'm always trying to get better abs dude so tell me uh tell me an ab circuit I should start doing okay all right well I'll tell you the one I just did before I hopped on my call so uh you grab two dumbbells relatively light maybe 10 15 pound dumbbells one in each hand you're going to lay down and do toe touches. So the feet go towards the sky, yep. your back is on the ground, and then you just crunch up, try to touch your toes with those dumbbells. Uh, I like to do what I just call at reps 50 or, or abs 50. So you're going to go 20, 15, 15 of that exercise. Right. Then you're going to put those dumbbells down. You're just going to do regular crunch. You'll go 20, 15, 15. And then you're going to do a – lateral or vertical crunch where you're going to touch the right elbow to the left knee and same thing and alternating 20 15 15 you got 10 minutes to knock all of those out abs 50 and if you do that your abs will be on fire if you do that three days a week you'll be one step closer to six pack abs but keep in mind abs are made in the kitchen That's they right. are made I, would, I should say abs are made in the weight room but the way you actually see them is from the kitchen you got to change nutrition that's the fact. That's, I tell people that all the time. Like, man, I got the abs. I just don't have the kitchen down all the time. <laughs> right. Like, we, anatomy, we all have actual abs. The majority of us just have a layer of fat that's hiding them. <laughs> well, Ramsey, man, it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, you're a cool dude. You've You've had an awesome, cool career. I mean, I don't know what could be next for you. Um, but obviously you'll be leading some program and, and their sports performance and, and on. So man, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you for coming on. Best of luck in the up- upcoming season. Um, I'm sure it won't be too long before the Jayhawks get another, another title. So uh, best of luck. And, and thank you again. Awesome. Sam. Well, thanks so much for reaching out. I'm glad we had an opportunity to chat and do this. So thank you. Of course.